In 1 Peter 2, verse 21 to 25, we will focus on that. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 to 25. But before that, if you have your Bible, kindly raise up your Bible and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I am a believer. Therefore, I am a receiver. I boldly confess that my mind is alert, my body is awake, and my heart is receptive. One word from the Lord. My life will never be the same again. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for this opportunity of studying your words. And we do acknowledge, Lord God, that you are the great teacher that we have in this place. Father, we pray that you open our hearts, open our ears, and teach us, Lord God, on the things that we need to adjust in our daily lives. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you are opening in 1 Peter 2, verse 21 to 25, I have with me Brother Andrew from uh, Ghana, and he's one of our students in the Bible school. And praise the Lord, we're doing the Bible school here for um, more than, uh, almost 10 years right now. And uh, we have at least, if I'm not mistaken, at least eight African, African graduates and two Indians, uh, one Australian, and one American. And God is opening a lot of doors for us. In the Philippines, I have a church in the south part of the Philippines. And we're doing, uh, we're going around the country in the Philippines to establish Bible schools. Especially in places that are not, uh, uh, that are not uh, capable to have trainings. We go to the mountains, we cross rivers, and we cross oceans. Anywhere God would open the door, we go. You know, and uh, we're doing this for the past at least 18 years already. And I'm already 28 years as a Christian. And I'm already 43 years old right now and looking forward to my 50s and 70s still strong and being used by the Lord. <laughs> so First Peter 2, verse 21 to 25, For you have been called to this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges right, righteously. And he, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his stripes you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have, you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Now First Peter 2, verse 21 to 25 Peter is focused on Christ and he emphasized in verse 21 that Christ also suffered and Christ did not just suffer but he lived he lived a life and that life is supposed to be followed. As, as Peter emphasized, he lived a life setting an example for us. We emphasize because the problem we have right now, you can be an example but are you a good example? Everybody can be example, but are you a good example? Now, everybody can be a Christian, but are you a spiritual Christian or are you a carnal Christian? As the Bible emphasizes, we have spiritual Christians, Christians who follow the will of God. We have carnal Christians, Christians who are not maturing spiritually, who are not changed in their character and following just themselves. And Jesus, uh, uh, Peter said here, Jesus sets an example for us. As uh, Paul himself said, you follow me, not just me, but because I'm following Christ. And the Bible emphasizes, you are the light and the salt of the world. The main objective of a single individual Christian, our main goal as a single individual Christian, is to be like Christ. Now, the main goal of the local church as a group, our main goal is to disciple people for Christ. 
Now, we have a problem discipling people for Christ. Why? Because the person discipling a person to Christ is not looking like Jesus Christ. You know, if you go to a factory and you want that product to be Jesus Christ, then the mold must be Jesus Christ. Are you getting the point? You know, and whether we like it or not, if the mold is not Jesus Christ, then, you know, people will just, will just go to church. That's why sometimes people go to church and they are happy, but they are not changed. What we want is to be happy and be changed. Because once we go out of this place, we want to have an impact in this place. You know, an impact with our jobs, an impact with our family. So, so Peter is showing us, this is the example that you should follow. Because it's hard to do something without following somebody. You know? Now, it would be easy because we have an example, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Even, even Paul emphasized, we can do anything through Christ who gives us strength. It's easy to, to declare that you are a Christian, but it's hard to really live a life of a of a Christian, you know? I mean, being a Christian, that, that would really be hard because you need to die to yourself. How did Jesus live his life for me to follow as an example? Again in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Now, notice that word, suffer. Now, before, I think if I'm not mistaken, the, the move of God before, 12th century to 15th century or 16th century, something like that, is holiness. And because of that move, holiness, uh, 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 they have also what we call uh, Puritan groups, which these Puritan groups have went to extreme. Now, because of that holiness, they are suffering for God. And basically, as they suffer for God, which is good, but the problem when it comes to Christianity we suffer for God because we are sacrificing for Him. The problem before, suffering was so embraced by Christians, and then when prosperity came, they rejected prosperity. Now, Christianity should be balanced. You know, because if Christianity would, Christianity would not be balanced, then you would be lopsided. Especially in this generation. If you would preach about suffering, that's not a popular preaching. If my topic is suffering... The, reac the reaction of the people would be like, like that. You know? <laughs> nobody would say amen, nobody would say hallelujah. You know? <laughs> but if you would preach about prosperity, if you would preach about God will bless you, God will promote you, I guarantee you, people will go crazy. You know? <laughs> Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying prosperity is bad. But we're trying to say Christianity should be balanced. Because whether we like it or not, we will experience suffering. Why we would experience suffering? Because we need to be ready to sacrifice for Christ. Jesus himself said, you need to carry your cross on a daily basis. Now, remember, the cross is a picture of sacrifice. You know, that's why we balance this. Because right now, the, when the faith movement came, most Christians embraced prosperity and hated suffering. Now, Christian life is both. You will have suffering and you will have prosperity, whether you like it or not. Now, why do we suffer? So how do we do this? Jesus lived a sacrificial life because he suffered. Because you could not suffer, you know, you could not experience sacrifice without suffering. If you're saying you're sacrificing, then guess what? You would suffer. Now, when we sacrifice, you know, or when we suffer, uh, what are the things that we are going through? Technically, we are suffering when we are, per we, when we are experiencing persecutions. A persecution is targeting your faith. The hardest persecution that you would, you would experience is inside the church with the brethren. Some people are being persecuted because they are drinking medicines. Because some, pe some people are saying, Stop drinking medicine. Just believe in Jesus Christ and you are healed. Throw away your medicine. And they are being criticized because they are drinking medicine. You know, as we see. And some, also pe some people also are being criticized because they don't drink medicine. Technically speaking, we have persecution on both camps. But supposed to be persecution would, coming, would be coming from outside of our camp, from the unbelievers, because it's persecuting our faith. 
especially in Christ. You know? That's why the Bible emphasizes, you who are spiritual, help them who are weak. If these people are drinking medicines, then, you know, praise God, God can use the medicine. Amen. You know, so, because uh, if they will throw away the medicine, what would happen? Then after two months, they will see God. Amen. You know, <laughs> and God will tell them, I told you don't throw away your medicine. You know? <laughs> so now this <laughs> Now, we experience suffering because we experience, tri we experience trials. Now, when it comes to trials, it is testing our flesh, technically speaking. So, how did Jesus uh, live his life? He lived his sacrificial life. How are we going to apply this in our life? We need to be ready to go out of our comfort zone. As human beings, we are creatures of habit. I asked Pastor Daniel uh, earlier, I asked, you know, what, uh, what time did we come here? Or what month did we come here? He said April. So April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So that's already nine months, right? April this year. So April up to now, it's nine months, if I'm not mistaken. So I guarantee you, because we're creatures of habit, most of you, the first time we started April, up to now, most of you are still sitting on the same place. Guaranteed. Why? Because we are creatures of habit. We do things the same way without even thinking about it. Especially if we are comfortable in doing that thing. Now, as a Christian, we're always comfortable to go to church, worship God, praise the Lord for that. You know, listen to preaching, praise the Lord for that. But you got to realize, God doesn't want you to just relax on your comfort zone. God wants us to be equipped in this place and go out, make disciples. Hello? You know? Now notice, we need to help the community. Now what community we need to start helping? First, our family. There's a problem sometimes in my country, you're good to the neighbors, but you're not good to the family. The neighbors would go to your house and the neighbors would say, Oh, your husband is very good. He's really helpful. And he's really diligent. You know? And the wife would be amazed and would wonder, Are you in the right house? <laughs> you know? Are you talking about my husband? Are you sure it's my husband? You know, as we see. We have a problem with that. Why? Because sometimes... We always like to have a good character outside our house, but inside our house, we're not respected. You know? And that's a problem. So when we help the community first, we help our own family. And then we help our neighbors and friends. And when it comes to helping the community, we help also our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Because Jesus himself, you need to love one another so that they will know. That you are my disciples. Now Jesus emphasized you need to love one another. Love one another, one another unconditionally. You know, now why do we need to love one another unconditionally? Because whether we like it or not, some of us have bad attitudes. Some of us has good attitudes. Some of us are in between. So basically I need to have what? Unconditional love so that I, can, I could understand. Even though you have a bad attitude... I could understand that you're, God, you're, you're, you're being processed by the Lord and being changed by God. I always emphasize this in, the, this in the Bible school. It doesn't mean you're a pastor, meaning you have a pastor in your name. You're already matured. Because maturity is a lifetime process. You know? And maturity happens in our characteristic. Meaning you would see maturity in characteristics. Not in how he dressed, not in how he talks. And you would, you would really see the character of the person if you go to his house. Hello? You know? I always tell my, our students, you go to my house, talk to my family, talk to my wife. You go to my church, talk to my people. Because I want you to know me. Not the outside package, but you know me. Because sometimes we have a false impression when it comes to a person. 
Because we just see the outside package. Hello? You know? So notice, uh, we help the community start with our family and then our local church and then outside our local church. Now we would like to emphasize this because before when I was a young Christian, we help the community outside our local church, but there is a condition. You know, for example, uh, we would help you when it comes to your children going to school, but you still first, uh, you, you need first to attend the Bible study. After attending the Bible study for three months, then we will help you. Now, I don't believe, this is me personally, I don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't believe that is what God wants us to do. God wants us to help the community, especially, you know, you as Africans. You help your own community. I, I told this to our Filipino friends. We help our fe fellow Filipinos, not because they are born again, but because they need help. Hello? Remember, when, when somebody would come to Jesus and that person is blind, Jesus would not say, if that person would come to Jesus and that person would say, Lord, I want to see. Oh, wait, wait. Peter, come. Did this person attend already our Bible study? <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. And Peter would ask, oh, what's your name, sir? Uh, James. Oh, James. Wait, wait, huh? Uh, there's no record, Lord. Oh, oh, James, you first need to attend the Bible study. And then you come back to me. Of course, Jesus would not do that. And somebody would come and say, Lord, I want to see. And then Jesus, Jesus would say, do you believe that you would see? Yes, Lord, I, would, I believe I will see. Then you would see. Then they would go on their way. We help people because people need help. Jesus say, when I am hungry, you did not feed me. Jesus say, when I'm in prison, you did not visit me. Jesus say, when I am naked, you did not clothe me. And they said, Lord, when did you become hungry? When did you, when did you go to prison? And when did you become naked? What you do to the people who are in need, you do it for me. You know, that's why in the church we have what we call benevolent fund. I don't know if you have that here. In the Philippines, most churches have benevolent fund. Benevolent fund, what we do with that benevolent fund is we help the community outside the church, not just the brethren. And we help without conditions. You know, we help because we need help. We don't help you because you go to church. No, no, no. We help you because you need help. Now, if you go to church, praise God. If you don't go to church, we still praise God. You know, because these people will praise God because they see the goodness of God in what we have done in their lives. As the Bible emphasizes, the goodness of the Lord will lead people to repentance. And how would people see the goodness of the Lord? The goodness of the Lord would happen through us. Hello? Helping the community. So notice, uh, we help the community. Uh, going out of our comfort zone, how do we do this? Give extra of our time for free. We need a lot of volunteers in the church. If you think this church have enough workers, I guarantee you, we still lack workers. For the past uh, 21 years of pastoring, one of the main problems of every church, since I was pastoring for 21 years, one of the main problems of every church is what? We lack workers. Why do we lack workers? This is the big question. Why do you lack workers? Now, if you are a Christian, you are spiritually gifted by God. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> All Christians are spiritually gifted by God. So just imagine this. You have people who are spiritually gifted, and I guarantee you, you have talents and abilities. I don't know if you have been in our ECAC Family Day. You guys uh, host the ECAC Family Day. And when you do praise and worship, my goodness, you do it powerfully. You know? And most Filipinos could not uh, cope up. You know? <laughs> and you would see a lot of Filipinos sitting down, only Africans standing and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> singing and praising God. <laughs> Why? Because you're so energetic, full of talents, full of abilities. But the big question is, why is it 
we lack workers because you have people who doesn't want to experience inconvenience. We're not saying quit your jobs. What we're trying to say is if you have a free time, why not give that to the Lord? Are you getting me right now? We're not saying quit your jobs, huh? We would like to clarify that. What we're trying to say, if you have free time. Now, I, I understand we need to rest. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I, under, I understand we need to do our daily chores in our houses. But then again, if you still have free time. Because not every day you, you sleep. Not every day you do your laundry. Most of the time you do that one day. Most of the time you sleep, what, six hours in a day. And basically, you have at least, what, three hours of free time, two hours of free time? Because most of us could, you know, juggle through our Facebook for a minimum of one hour. And we don't even notice that. Oh, it's already one hour. You know, <laughs> so notice that. <laughs> so give extra of our time for free. Remember what, Jesus, what God said in Malachi? Now, remember, in Malachi, God is talking to the Levites. The workers. God told the Levites, well, you know, are you doing this because you love me or are you doing this because you're paid? And God himself said, if you would not be paid, you would not even like this torch. Meaning you're just doing this because you're paid. That's why it's hard to raise up leaders in the church because we're volunteers. Unlike in our companies, when somebody was fired, it's easy to get somebody hired because there is a salary. You know, in the church when you say, how many of you would like to commit to ushering ministry? If you would say that as a pastor, if you would say that, how many of you would like to commit to ushering ministry? Yeah, that's would, that what, what would happen. Nobody would raise up their hands, you know. No way, man, I'm busy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now notice, <laughs> now he lived a sacrificial life, suffering so that others will prosper. Now we understand it, we understand it for, understand this for some degree because we are away from our families. So technically speaking, we're suffering right now and our families are enjoying the benefits. In my country, you know, I, I always balance this as, as you know. <laughs> I, I told the OFW, overseas Filipino workers, I told them, yes, we're suffering here. But you got to realize, our families also are suffering in our country. Because sometimes we're so selfish, we are just the one who's suffering. No, no, no. You got to realize, they are suffering also. But they, their suffering would be gone if you would send the money. You know. <laughs> and your suffering will, will, will be doubled. Why? You send the money. <laughs> but then again, you know, we're doing this because, you know, somebody would benefit from this. Now notice, when we do ministry for God, it's really hard. It's hard on the body, but not on the heart. In the Philippines, doing Bible school in the provinces, I, I need to travel in Quezon province, I need to travel one way, at least six hours. Now, I will be the one driving. I will be the one teaching. I would wake up 12 a.m. and I need to go out of the house before 1 a.m. So that I could arrive in that place 7 a.m. And I need to rest, not take a nap for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Because I will start to teach 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then go home again. Now, going home is really hard. You would take a lot of time because you have a lot of trucks in the streets. So it, it would take me around eight hours to nine hours going home. And we're doing that at least three times a week in the Philippines. And they are asking me, Pastor, are you not you know, experiencing uh, uh, tiredness or what? Well, the body would be weak. The body would experience uh, you know, fatigue. But then again, because you love doing it. When the body gets a rest, it would stand up and do it again and again and again. That's why God emphasizes in the Old Testament that obedience is always better than the sacrifice. Meaning God is always looking at the condition of your heart. Meaning if you go to church just because you don't have anything, 
anywhere else to go. Then, you know, going to church is useless. You go to church because you want to see God. You go to church because you want to experience the presence of God. You just don't go to church because you would kill time. Because after church, the mall is open. So we go to the mall, you know. <laughs> no, don't hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> we, <laughs> we are a sinful person if we go to the mall. What I'm trying to say, are, what are, why are you here? That's a big question. Why am I here in the church? You know? So notice, uh, how did Jesus live his life? Point number two, verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Now he lived a righteous life. We would like to clarify this. this. Jesus did not show us a perfect life. He showed us a righteous life. Now Jesus is perfect. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But he did not show us to live a perfect life. He showed us how to be righteous in front of God and in front of man. Because he, if he will show us how to be perfect, then nobody here would pass the test. Integrity. Now, we would like to clarify this. We always clarify this in our Bible school. Integrity in a person, you know, a person that has integrity, it doesn't mean that person doesn't commit mistake. You know, because sometimes we have a thinking, well, that person has integrity, well, that person doesn't commit mistake. No, 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 no. That person has integrity because he's not just doing what is right, but when he is wrong, he will do what is right. And that is to admit his mistake and tell sorry to the person that he hurt and change the bad things that he has done. Oh, that person has integrity. Remember, all people in the Bible that God used, he would call people who has integrity. But you got to realize, he called Moses, he has integrity, but you got to realize Moses is a murderer. Hello? You know? Now, God called David who has integrity, but David is an adulterer and a murderer at the same time. But then again, don't hear what I'm not saying. Eh? I'm not saying continue to do bad works, but we're trying to say a person that has integrity is doing what is right. And then when he sees that he's wrong, he's man enough and woman enough to admit that he's wrong. Because it takes maturity and courage to admit that you're wrong. And once you admit that you're wrong, you're lifting up again your integrity. You know, it's hard to commit a mistake because, you know, you will suffer persecution. In our time, we call that you will suffer bashing. You know, but then again, we need to realize we could not turn back the hands of time. But face what happened. And admit that we are wrong. And you got to realize if you would do that, people would really respect you. More than before. Because they see integrity in that person. I always say this to to our brothers and sisters and people who would come with me. Don't look at me as a person who would not make mistakes. Because you would be disappointed. Hello? You know, because some Christians would always, you would always give us a grade. You know, when, when you would see a pastor, you would always give us, give us a grade of 100%. <laughs> and then all the while, you will, you will be, you know, a friend to us. And technically, you will, you will find some things that, you know, would really bother you. And that grade would go down. You know? Why? Why, why is that, that grade is going down? Because you're, you're giving us wrong expectation. And sometimes also as a pastor, I always emphasize this to my pastor friends. Sometimes as a pastor, why, why Christians give us that grade? Because we give a wrong impression. You know, we give Christians the impression that we're not experiencing weakness in our faith. We're not being challenged when it comes to our marriage and our children. But guess what? What you're experiencing is I'm also experiencing. But guess what? By the grace of God, He helps us. You know? So notice, uh, we live with integrity, doing things that is right and correcting the things that are wrong. Now, we live with honesty. Now, I don't know if you know Joel. I forgot the surname. He's my friend, Joel. 
And Joel said, Honesty is such a lonely word, for everyone is so untrue. Now, that is a song of an American singer you know, <laughs> who was named Joel, you know, as we see. He said, honesty is such a lonely word for everyone is so untrue. Now, why is it everyone is so untrue? Because you're saying you're being honest, but then, then again, there's no transparency. If you want to be honest, be transparent. How can I prove that you are honest if I could not see any evidence? For example, to the husband and the wife, you know, in order for us to be honest, then both parties need to know how many Facebook accounts do you have? Do you have... Are you getting the point? Do you have Instagram? You know? Do you have WhatsApp, you know, or anything, you know, as we see? And both parties know what's the password. Hello? You know? Because you're telling me you're being honest to me, but then again, I could not see your phone. Something fishy is going on around here. You know? Now, praise God, because of technology, what God did, He put a thumb mark password. Now, Filipino women are wise. I don't know when it comes to African women, huh? I could only tell when it comes to, you know, my fellow men. Filipino women are wise. If you don't want them to, if you don't want your wife to know your password, no problem. Your wife will just say, okay, relax, you go to sleep. When you go to sleep, you know, and you're really deep in your sleep, he will get your right arm and your fingers and your cell phone, and guess what? Voila! He's in! She's in, you know, as you see. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and because she's in, what would happen? She will know everything. And just imagine, you would be shocked, because 3 a.m. in the morning, your wife is standing beside your bed, and her eyes is like this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and your wife is doing this, you know, to you. What's this? Explain this. <laughs> you know? And you could not really retaliate, especially if you just wake up in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning. Now notice, as a church, how do we show transparency? I always tell this to my friends. In order for you to show transparency, then you need to have records of your finances. Now, I would like to clarify. Only members have the right to see the records. Because we, we, we teach this in the Bible school, we have, we have a subject called biblical membership. Not all people who go to church are considered members. You know? Now, only members have the right to look, you know, at the records of the finances because whether we like it or not, most people in the church would always think, you know, not what's, you know, what's our food. They would always think, how do they use the money in the church? They would always think that. You know, for the past 21 years of pastoring, people always think that. Now, if you don't have records to show that and people would see that you have your new shoes, you know, people would think, oh, no. You know? And then the next Friday, they would see you have a new suit. Oh, no. You know? <laughs> you know? What's happening right now? In my case, for the past 11 years of handling the church, I'm not holding the money of the church. I'm not even counting the money of the church. Somebody would hold that. Somebody would count that. You know? I don't want to do anything regarding the money of the church because I would like to people to see transparency. You know, because whether we like it or not, the devil could use the money to give us doubt. You know? I mean, in order for that doubt to go away, then I need to be transparent. Now, how do we do this, a righteous life? We live with sincerity. Now, you got to realize this. Without integrity, you could not have honesty. Without honesty, you could not have sincerity. You know? Now, how do we live with sincerity? No hidden agendas. Whether we like it or not, as human beings, we always have hidden agendas. That's why God would want us to mature. 
in Filipino churches, we experience this. I don't know if you would experience this in your African churches, but in Filipino churches, we experience this. Some people will go to church and look at the church members. If they see the church members are potential because they have, you know, they have good dress, you know, good jewelries, meaning these people are potentials, meaning these people have a lot of money. What they would do is they would go to church for seven months and they would be a good friend to that person that is potential. You know? And then afterwards, that person would cry and that person would say, I need help because somebody died. My grandmother died. Although, her, you know, his grandmother died two years ago. My grandmother dies, you know. <laughs> I need help. And because that person was already close to, to the Christian, he would say, oh, don't cry, don't cry. We will do something about that. I will lend you money. And after the person lent the money to that, uh, to that person who asked for money, what would happen? That person will disappear. Now you're laughing, probably, you know, it's happening already. You know? <laughs> so, so, so that person will disappear. And all the while, the person that, you know, uh, uh, is asking where he borrowed the money, that person is asking, did you see brother so-and-so? And the person that he asked, if he sees brother so-and-so, was also shocked. And that person would say, oh, so he borrowed money also from you? <laughs> So, you could relate. Now notice, huh? as we see here, point number three, how did Jesus live his life? Verse 23. And while being revived, he did not revive and return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So he did not respond evil with evil. As, as the Bible emphasized, do good with evil. Now, unless you have maturity, Normally, what we do, we respond evil by evil. We studied this in the Bible school, uh, the subject, try on being. We have what we call our subconscious mind. And in our subconscious mind are pre-programmed attitudes and characters for 21 years. That's why the Bible emphasizes, as a Christian, you need to renew the mind. Romans 12, verse 2. Renew the mind by the perfect will of God, which is the word of God. Because whether we like it or not, that, that subconscious mind, you know, it's just a matter of time. It will pop up. For example, consciously, if somebody is, you know, if somebody is fighting you consciously, what you do, don't even quarrel with him or fight with him. Now, consciously, we know that, right? But what's happening? We're not doing that. Why husband and wife, mostly, they would quarrel. Although they know it's not healthy to quarrel. But technically, as husband and wife, we quarrel. Why? Because we respond subconsciously. So we need to what? We need to have a right mind. How do, we need to, how do we have a right mind? We need the Word of God. All Christians know the Word of God, but do all Christians have the Word of God? Jesus said, you love me? He said that. If you love me, then my words. Hello? My words must be in you, if you love me. Now, all Christians love Jesus, right? Can I hear an amen? You know, but then again, if you, if you would ask Christians, do they know the word of God? Probably some from the word of God they would know. You know, that's why if you would notice, some Christians would fall away from the faith. Why? Because don't, they don't know the Truth of the Word of God. Now notice, uh, he did not respond evil with evil, having a right heart. Now when it comes to the mind, it's part of the soul. And when it comes to the heart, it's talking about the attitude. Now attitude is on the inside. Now whether you, you like it or not, you can pretend and be good on the outside. But you could not do that forever. Your true colors will come shining through, you know, as Bill Collins would say. It will come shining through. Why? Because the real you is on the inside. 
And it's just a matter of time that we see the real person. That's why what we want, as David said, Lord, know me and search my heart. As the Bible emphasizes, out of your heart comes all the conditions of life. So, Paul also said, you need a circumcision of the heart. You know, not just with the flesh. Renewing the heart. Because whether we like it or not, uh, uh, because of this evil mindset, the heart is not being renewed. Now, having a right action. Now, remember that right action is conduct. Now, if the heart is right, the action would be easy. If the heart is wrong, the action is hard. Meaning, it would be hard for you to be good because you're not really good. But it would be easy for you to be good because you're really good. For example, why is it Americans, it's easy for them to speak in English. Filipinos are amazed when they see Americans. Wow, they are very good in English. You know? <laughs> now, why are we amazed? They are, you know, wow, because that's them. It's not hard for them to speak that because that's them. You know? Now notice, if you're really changed, then it's not hard for you to show it. Now notice, huh? there's a difference between what you have to do or what you're supposed to do. As Christians, what do we have to do? When we, when we experience financial struggles, what do we have to do? As Christians, we... You know, some, some of my Filipino friends, what we, need, we have to do is, I have financial difficulties, I would borrow. And not just borrowing money from my friends, but borrowing the money of God. As Christians, we don't do that. When we have financial difficulties, we honor God all the more. That is what we are supposed to do. I told my wife when we started the ministry, God forbid we don't have anything to eat. We don't use the money of God. God forbid we walk home because we give the money. We don't use the money of God. Now you got to realize when I'm here in Qatar, I don't work. I only come here to teach in Bible school. I'm already full-time in the ministry in the Philippines and here. Now they don't pay me to teach in the Bible school. Now in the Bible school, we need to, uh, to have at least 30 students so that I could finance my visa, and my ticket. As of the moment, they would graduate 14 students. So technically, that's the visit already. As of the moment, we have batch 36, we have four students. So technically, that's very, very deficit in the records. But for 10 years of doing the Bible school, not even one time, I gave a solicitation letter among the graduates telling them, I need money for my ticket and my visa. What do I mean by that? For 10 years, God is faithful for 10 years. You know? Now why God is faithful for 10 years? You need to do what you're supposed to do not what you have to do. God is expecting us to give His money because the Bible emphasizes. Jesus Himself said, you give to God what's due to God. Jesus said that. You give to Caesar what's due to Caesar. You know, Jesus did not say, well, if you have financial difficulty, no problem, don't give to me. He did not say that, you know. <laughs> God said, if you have financial difficulty, test me. Hello? You know, you test me. For the past 10 years, I did not fail to send 2,500 reals every month to my family. For the past, again, I don't have a job. I don't have a salary. If God would bless me with something, I would guarantee that, you know, the tithes would go to Him. The offering would go to Him. Just imagine for the past 10 years, 2,005, 2,500 riyals. If you would calculate that in my country, that's already around 4 million pesos. Hello? You know, and, you know, I'm really amazed what God is doing. In my country, my expenses is at least a month 
because I need to pay for the car of my wife, the ministry vehicle, for the gasoline, just for the ministry vehicle, I need to pay 31000 The car of my wife, I need to pay 12000 Just for the gasoline, for the car of my wife, full tank is one five. Uh, for the ministry vehicle, because that's a pickup truck in order to go to rivers and, you know, climb mountains, we would spend two eight, And that's already paid for in full. The car is paid for in full. The pickup is already paid for in full. And we don't lack anything. Not because we're rich, but because we trust God. There's a lot of times I don't have money in the pocket. But I would not be in a you know, pitiful situation because God would always provide. Hello? But I need to remind one thing. I need to do what I am supposed to do. For example, growing old, that's automatically will happen. You know, growing big, that's automatically will happen. <laughs> Especially in the Filipino community. You know? If we see a person that's already big, we would, we would ask the person, how long have you been here in Qatar? You know, and that person would say, oh, it's already 10 years. Oh, okay. If we see a Filipino, thin, you know, we would say, are you new here? You know? <laughs> now, notice that. <laughs> we need to what? We need to have unconditional love. That's why, remember, God asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Unconditionally. And Peter said, Lord, I love you. As a friend. Jesus said, do you love me? Agape. Peter said, I love you. Phileo, as a friend. Again, second time, Jesus, Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? Unconditionally. Second time, Peter asked. Peter answered, Yes, Lord, I love you as a friend. The third time, what Jesus did, Peter, do you love me as a friend? Now, notice that. God is willing to go down at your level. But God doesn't want us to stay at that level. God wants us to go in His level. We love people unconditionally. Why? Because again, if we don't love, we hate there's no in-between. So if you're not loving now, then technically you're hating. Hello? Now notice, huh? He forgives. The main, one of the main problems Christians have right now is unforgiveness. Jesus always emphasized us in prayer. When you pray, you forgive. You know? Now why do we have unforgiveness? Because we are hurt. Now why can we forgive? Because we base our forgiveness based on our emotion. You don't forgive based on your emotion. You forgive based on decision. Because that's the right thing to do. Forgive the person so that the person would not be released. You will be released from your hurt. Now probably you're telling me, Pastor, you're saying that because you have not experienced that. No. Every one of us have experienced a Judas in our life. Are you understanding me when I said that? There is somebody close to you and that person betrayed you. And you could not even imagine that that person could do that to you. And because of that, you could not even forgive, forgive that person. In my case, I, I was betrayed by you know, a lot of leaders in the church. For 18 years, I spent most of my pastoring career in that church. And one day, they told me, we don't consider you as a pastor of this church. Imagine that, for 18 years. And then one day they will tell you, we don't consider you as a pastor of this church. Oh, that really hurts. You know what I did? I told God, Lord, I will not go to the church anymore. I will not talk to any pastor anymore or leaders anymore. And if I will find a grenade, <laughs> you know, if I find a grenade, I will take out the pin and throw it at them because these people will still go to heaven. You know, <laughs> you know, and you got to realize I did not tell that jokingly to God. I tell that to God seriously. You know, now why did I tell that to God seriously? Because I'm so hurt out of all people. Why you for 18 years of being a Christian? Why like this? 
You know? But then again, we need to what? We need to forgive. During that time, I praise God for Joel Austin, his best life now. For three months, I'm listening for that best life now. And I'm arguing with him. You're telling me your best life now? Do you know my situation right now? You know? <laughs> but then again, God changed my heart. And right now, I, for, I have forgiven those leaders. And right now, we're, we're, we're already close friends again. Now, what happened? You forgive based on decision. Now, the hurt would not immediately disappear, but every time you forgive, the hurt would lessen. Every time you would imagine the person, you would say, Lord, I forgive that person. Every time you would hear the name of the person, you would say, Lord, I forgive that person. And what's happening, the pain would lessen and lessen until the time you see the person and there's no more pain. And you would say to that person, my brother, I miss you. What's happening right now? Genuinely, you would say that to that person. Now notice. Let God say to your enemies, it's payback time. The real revenge that would happen to our enemies if they would experience Jesus in their lives. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> I think most of you doesn't want your enemies to be born again. <laughs> Again, huh? the real revenge that God would do with our enemies is when they would accept the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. Remember what happened to, to Paul, who was sold before? Persecuting Christians. And what happened when he encountered God? He loved the Christian, not persecuting Christian. And he was also persecuted. Now lastly, point number five. Verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his stripes you were healed. So he offered himself. Now whether we like it or not, in the church, God would always ask us. Are you, are, he would always ask us, are you willing to serve me? Now he would just ask us. He would not push us to do that. But he would just ask us, are you willing to serve me? You know, Because in the Old Testament, you know, God said, well, you're doing this for me. But your heart is far away from me. So what he wants is willingness. Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah said, if you are willing and obedient. You know? So he offered himself. And just like us, especially to those uh, Christians who raise up your hands that you are already five-year-old Christians and above. Are you willing to commit to God? Are you willing to offer your life for him? Because Jesus himself said, we lack laborers. The harvest is ripe, but we lack laborers. Now, we emphasize this in the Bible school. Where would the labor force would come? From the children of God. Hello? Jesus said, you pray for laborers. He has many children, but he has few laborers. This is the irony up to now that I'm thinking. You have Christians who are full of the Spirit. You have Christians who are full of ability and talents. And you have Christians right now who are very equipped to do the ministry. But why, are, why is it they are sitting down and doing nothing? Hello? That's a big question. Even right now, I could not answer that. And the only, the only thing that I could see, well, you know, unless you're willing to offer yourself to God you would not really commit to the ministry. Now notice that, he offered himself, he's willing, he volunteered, and he see the need. Now if you're saying you're the member of this church, you would know the need. And not just knowing the need of this church, you will respond to solve the problem in that need. For example, Paul said, as a church, we are just like a body. If the head experiences headache, Automatically, the hands would go to the head and the hands would massage the head. Why? Because it's experiencing headache. Why? Because the hand is part of the body. And the hands know the problem of the head. You know, it's experiencing headache, so he would do this. You know, the head would not say to the hand, Oh, hands, please, can you help me? 
You know? He would not do that automatically, without even asking. That's automatic. Now, what's happening right now in our churches? We lack laborers. Now, how do we offer ourselves? We need to die. And Jesus needs to live. As Paul emphasized, I am dead to sin. And now Christ is living in me. Now, in conclusion, Jesus showed us good example about the right way of living. It's not easy, but we can do all things through Christ, which gives us strength. Let's bow down our heads and we will pray. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your words. Now, how many of you right now who are here in this place? And probably you're wondering, Pastor, I want to experience the fullness of Christ in my life. You could only experience the fullness of Christ in your life if you have relationship with Christ. I'm not asking if you know God. Through religion, we can know God. But only through Christ, we can have relationship with God. If you're here right now and you are the person that I'm talking to and you're telling me, Pastor, I want to have relationship with God. I want to be right in front of God right now. What are the things that we need to do? The Bible emphasizes. You just admit that you are a sinner. Open your heart and let Jesus be the Lord of your life and be the Savior of your life. If you're here right now, I'm not asking if you have a religion. I'm asking, do you have relationship with Jesus Christ? If somebody could relate with that, you don't have to come in front. You just have, you just have to raise up your hands and we will pray. If you're telling me right now, Pastor, I'm the person that you're talking about. I don't have relationship with Jesus and I want to fix my relationship with Jesus today. If you are that person, raise up your hands and put it down and we will pray. Praise the Lord. As you raise up your hand, put it down, we will pray. So let this prayer be a personal prayer. Lord, right now I see myself as a sinner. I open my heart to you. Accept you as my Lord and Savior. Lord, from this day forward, I give everything to you and surrender everything to you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, as you said in your words, anybody would come to you you would accept, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, because of your suffering at the cross. Our sins are forgiven. You have made us brand new. And you have made us your sons and daughters, Lord God. And because of that, that person is already listed in the book of life. And we rebuke every work of the enemy in their lives in Jesus' name because they are right now a property of God. Now, how many of you right now as we have said, God wants to offer ourselves to Him. I do believe. Some of you here are full of spiritual gift, full of talents and abilities. Some of you here are already equipped by God, but you're hesitating to commit to the ministry and serve God. This is the time that God is saying, I need laborers. Now, how many of you here who would respond to God? You would say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Send me. I want to pray for you. If you're that person, you raise up your hands and put it down. We will pray. Thank you. As you raise up your hands, put it down. We will pray. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Father, we pray right now as you have seen our hands lifted up. Lord, we declare we want to serve you, Lord God. Thank you for your spiritual giftings, abilities, and equipping, Lord God. Father, right now, open doors of opportunity for ministry with those brothers and sisters who have raised up their hands, Lord God. We respond to the call, Lord God. Here we are. Use us, Lord God, mightily. Thank you for this wonderful church that you're using mightily here in Qatar. Thank you, Lord God, for all the miracles that you have done in this church. Thank you for the life of the leaders in this church. And we pray, Father, that the love, compassion, mercy, and understanding would always flow in this church. 
Thank you for your mighty presence right now that we are experiencing. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.